Welcome to the Wednesday afternoon lecture to those of you here in Missouri and those who are watching remotely by video. I think we're going to have a very interesting presentation this afternoon from Christopher Garcia from Stanford, who will be talking about tuning cell surface receptor signaling uh, through structure-based ligand engineering, talking about a couple of systems, uh, one of which uh, went and frizzled is familiar to many of us, uh, but also something from the immune system that may be a little less familiar, at least to those of us uh, who haven't focused on that part of cell biology. Dr. Garcia is professor of molecular and cellular physiology and structural biology at Stanford University School of Medicine and an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, he got his undergraduate uh, degree from Tulane and then a PhD in biophysics uh, from Hopkins. His faculty uh, career has been almost entirely at Stanford where he came up through the ranks uh, as assistant professor, then associate and then investigator of HHMI and full professor starting in 2007. And he's an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences. His work has covered quite a number of systems but all focused on this idea about how ligands and receptors uh, can interact and uh, some of the structures that he's produced most notably I think for those of us who saw the paper about Winton Frizzled have really been quite stunning. Uh, perhaps he'll talk a bit about this whether you want to call it pincers of a crab or a thumb and an index finger it's still quite a remarkable three-dimensional structure. On top of all of that I've just learned that he's an ultra marathoner and a banjo player and as John O'Shea and I just agreed, those things always go together. So it's really wonderful to have him here today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Christopher Garcia. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for having me here today, for inviting me to this lecture. Um, uh, this is a big deal, I know, and uh, as John reminded me today, the Dalai Lama was one of the former speakers, so he asked me to have some uh, equally profound philosophical, um, uh, sorry, some equally profound philosophical enlightenments as the Dalai Lama, so <laughs> I'll try to do that. Um, so today, uh, just to get started, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what I do and what my lab does, just in a very general way. Um, which is we're interested in cell surface receptors and how they engage ligands. Uh, the process of clustering and dimerization that occurs in the, uh, after, after engaging ligands that's usually a prerequisite for signaling. And then ultimately uh, the conformational changes that occur to relay uh, a signal across a membrane. And we're particularly interested in pleiotropic receptor systems and that's Pleiotropic receptor systems are those in which a given receptor engages more than one ligands on a variety of cell types, and these uh, produce different signals and have different functional outcomes. And this property certainly is a property of cytokine receptors, which historically probably most of you know uh, for the, that I've worked on, um, but it also is a property of many other receptor systems. And the way we look at these uh, properties in the lab is really everything is rooted in structure and biophysics, but the structure and biophysics is heavily informed by protein engineering, and we generate molecules with which we can probe uh, mechanisms, uh, function, but also generate molecules with, uh, that could be potential therapeutic leads. And so this is the overall lens that we view all the different receptor systems that we work on in the lab. Um, now, today, uh, you may have recognized these receptors here as being cytokine receptors, and that's true. Um, but today I'm going to talk about two relatively new programs in the lab that the principles are really applicable to all the kinds of systems we work on. And this is, again, looking at this issue of um, receptor ligand pleiotropy and using engineering to, re to rewire pleiotropic systems. And one of them is the, the highly pleiotropic Wnt frizzled interaction system and the second part of my seminar, I'm going to be talking about a more general problem of deorphanizing cell surface receptors. Uh, and this is a major problem now, given that approximately 50% of our cell surface receptors 
in our genome remain orphans. And I'm going to tell you about some techniques. And eventually, these two topics kind of curl back around on each other at the end. So starting off uh, uh, discussing WINT, um, so WINT, I'm not going to give much of an introduction. I think uh, many of us know WINT is a developmentally uh, regulated uh, morphogen that is important for all kinds of developmental signals and tissue regeneration. And um, WINT is a lipidated molecule that is secreted and engages two receptors. One is the frizzled transmembrane uh, receptor. It's a 7TM receptor. It engages the ligand binding domain, and it also engages a second receptor called LRP6. And this, act, this binding event occurs extracellularly, and it, it, it initiates several different signaling pathways. And this is kind of a great example of pleiotropy in that we Wnt induce Wnt, Wnt beta catenin signaling. Um, it also, uh, there's controversy over Wnt's whether they induce G protein coupled signaling because the receptors are 7 TMs. And also, there's non canonical Wnt signaling, which is the planar cell polarity and the calcium pathways. And really, there's a, a, a rather fuzzy uh, definition of the mechanisms, of, uh, particularly through the non canonical pathways, but through the um, uh, canonical pathways, it's pretty well understood. Uh, uh, the mechanisms of Wnt beta catenin signaling. Now, Wnt also has a variety of other receptors, such as RIC and ROR, which are thought to somehow participate in the signaling complex as part of the non canonical cascade. Now, the way I came into this problem um, was this, this issue that this very interesting biological um, uh, properties of Wnt in that. Throughout development and adulthood, Wnt's have a homeostatic range of expression. And Wnt expression peaks and troughs at various stages. And these peaks and troughs um, can, be, can be normal and coincide with uh, tissue development and stem cell differentiation and self-renewal. Um, they can also be the result of injury. Uh, Wnt's are heavily involved in tissue regeneration. Cancer certainly uh, is uh, a consequence in many cases of Wnt signaling dysregulation. And uh, troughs, uh, neural, neural, neural degeneration, uh, appears to have some uh, linkage to uh, the absence of Wnt. And so there's been a lot of therapeutic interest in harnessing this pathway, but we really haven't had any picture of how Wnt's engage their receptors. So where we came into this about six or seven years ago was really to try to gain structural access to the Wnt frizzled system. And that's really the way we look at structure in my lab. Um, we, we, we determine crystal structures to gain access so we can do ligand engineering to, um, to, to, to study these pathways and, um, and potentially develop therapeutics. Now, the other aspect of Wnt's that was so compelling from an extracellular standpoint was that we have 19 Wnt's in our genome and 10 frizzles. And there's no known particular ligand receptor matching code. We don't know why there are so many or whether particular Wnt's engage specific frizzles to mediate specific biological processes. So we started off thinking that a structure of Wnt might help us understand this cross-reactivity issue and perhaps engineer uh, Wnt's with, with, with particular frizzled specificities that could be used to interrogate um, these, these pathways. So why did we, uh, it took us a long time. And uh, it, after about six years of effort, um, we succeeded. But the challenges we faced going into this were uh, some, some unusual challenge for, for determining a structure of a protein. Um, Wnt's are lipid modified. And that's quite unusual for a secreted growth factor. Um, this was uh, reported by a Roll Nusa back in 2003. Um, Wnt's are also heavily glycosylated. Uh, they're cysteine rich. Uh, there's no, there was no known predicted structure of Wnt's. Uh, it, it very, it, the sequence uh, really predicted that it was going to be an unusual structure no matter what we saw. Um, and this problem here, the, the inability to express recombinant Wnt's, has really brought the field to its knees. I mean, you just can't make these molecules in large quantities and study them. And that's certainly a requirement for structural biology. And as I mentioned earlier, there are few validated high-affinity Wnt pairs that we could go after specific complexes. 
So what we did was we uh, did an expression screen of pretty much every wind from several different organisms and we eventually set on Xenopus wind 8 as one that we could express large quantities of and by large quantities here I mean a Kumasi band on a gel. The, the, the blue band is the signal to a structural biologist that uh, you can probably get enough to try and crystallize. And it's convenient because the Xenopus wind 8 Winds are highly conserved in their sequence, and Xenopus wind 8 is active on human and, and mouse and other mammalian winds. And so there was a lot of early work done by uh, Randy Moon and Jeremy Nathans and others in characterizing Xenopus wind 8, so we had a large body of functional literature to correlate the structure. Now, um, we also looked at the wind frizzled specificity here using an ELISA that was originally uh, developed by Jeremy Nathans where we alkaline phosphatase labeled Xenopus wind 8 and we screened its reactivity with different frizzles. And we found that it bound principally to frizzled 5 and frizzled 8, a little bit to frizzled 4, and some of these soluble frizzled binding inhibitors. So we set out to form complexes between Xenopus wind 8 and frizzled 8 uh, to determine the structure. Now, um, winds have historically been treated like membrane proteins. They require detergents because of this lipid modification. And uh, we developed an affinity purification for WINTS where we, where we fused the frizzled 8 ligand binding domain to an FC and then captured WINT, and then we purified it by cleaving that off an affinity column. And you can see here by gel filtration, the frizzled and the WINT, they don't cleanly coelute. The WINT and the frizzled seem to slide past each other a little bit. So uh, my postdoc, Claudia Agenda, after several years of, of dealing with this issue, um, finally did a very simple experiment, which she tried to do the same thing, and she left out the detergent. And uh, when she did that, you can see everything snapped into a stoichiometric one-to-one -one complex and eluded very nicely on gel filtration. And so that told us, at this point, that that lipid is probably involved in some way in engaging its receptor because we could withdraw detergent and the wind remained soluble and formed a tight complex. And so uh, this led to the crystallization and the structure determination, which I'm not going to really uh, go heavily into, but I just wanted to show you uh, the structure that, uh, that Francis was alluding to earlier. Uh, and uh, wind is in pink here and the frizzled ligand binding domain is in blue, and you can see, as Francis mentioned, the thumb and the index finger kind of grasping the frizzled CRD, and that, that's the lipid group that's emanating. It's a post-translational modification that's coming off the tip of the wind here, and it's inserting itself into a deep groove on the frizzled CRD. Now, that deep groove is, uh, is really, uh, Sorry. You can see how deeply this lipid is buried in this groove here. And uh, it's really the only receptor ligand interaction that I know of in nature where it's mediated in part by a post-translationally added lipid modification. And so this also resolved what is the role of the lipid? Why are wince lipidated? Um, they're lipidated to engage their receptor. There used to be some thinking that maybe wince were lipidated to anchor them to the plasma membrane um, and, and prevent them from, sec from, from secreting too far away from the site that they were expressed, but clearly it's involved in, in interacting with the receptor here. Now, recently the structure of the smoothened ligand binding domain was reported, and smoothened is a class of receptor like frizzle that has a CRD and has seven TMs, but it's thought that smoothen doesn't have a ligand. And what we can see that this groove on the frizzled CRD that engages the lipid is also present in the smoothen CRD. And so there's now uh, increasing evidence to show that smoothen probably does bind some sort of a lipid ligand like, like frizzled. And the presence of this groove in that structure, even though we don't have it complexed with something, um, certainly uh, lends credence to that, to, the, to that idea that smoothen may indeed have a ligand. Now, the second part of the binding interface here of Wnt with frizzled is what we call the index finger. And uh, this, uh, this finger here is, is just a, a little short loop 
that's protruding into a cleft on the frizzled CRD. And um, the notable thing about this, this site right here is that the residues on frizzled that Wnt is engaging are much more um, polymorphic than the lipid engaging residues. So the residues on frizzled that the lipid binds to are almost completely conserved across all frizzled. So that's probably not a site for specificity determination. And it's likely that specificity is going to be more um, part of this interaction site. And what I've done here is just I've lined up all the frizzled sequences and I've colored in blue the residues that interact with Wnt. And you can just see quickly uh, many of these residues are different. And so there appears to be frizzled subtype specificity encoded in this site here. Now, before moving on to the engineering work we've been doing, this is the weirdest looking protein structure I've ever seen. And, and so it was very satisfying to see that in a way, but it really raised the question of how did this protein evolve? How did something like this, how did this fold evolve? Um, and we worked with Fernando Bazan uh, on this pr problem to see if we could recognize subdomains that might have been um, stolen from other proteins. And uh, it, it turns out to be a, a very interesting thing. So if we look at the N-terminal domain of Wnt, this fold right here, which has the lipid attached to it down here, it's a sapicin domain, it turns out, these helices. Now sapicins are lipid binding proteins that deliver lipids to other proteins. For instance, the human sapicins deliver lipids to CD1, which is an MHC-like protein that binds to lipids. And so it appears that somehow Wnt has, been, has used that domain but covalently grown this lipid on the sapicin domain. Now the second domain of Wnt here, if we look at it in isolation, it looks very much like cysteine not growth factors, like PDGF and IL-17, NOG, NOG and others like TGF, beta. It's a very large class of cytokines, but it's only half. Normally these are dimers. So what Wnt has done, it's fused together half of a cysteine not growth factor with the sapicin domain to create this molecule with two binding sites and two functionalities. And um, when we look at the way these cysteine knot growth factors engage their receptors, they use the fingertip just like the way Wnt engages their receptors. So if we can propose a, a plausible evolutionary path for how Wnt's might have evolved, and this is purely hypothetical here, um, we think maybe that, that the sapicin domain used to abstract lipids from the membrane and, and deliver them to the, wind, to the frizzled ligand binding domain while that cysteine knot growth factor engaged LRP. And then over time, this lipid group became covalently attached to the sapicin domain so that when it bound to frizzled, it didn't let go. And then there might have been some gene fusion event with that half of the growth factor that engages LRP and that resulted in a bifunctional molecule that on one hand is able to engage frizzled and then the other side bring in LRP. And so that, that's kind of the way we're, we're thinking about this at, at the moment. So now with structural access to Wnt and seeing how it binds frizzled, we can readdress this question here of Wnt frizzled specificity. And the way we're doing that is to try and engineer frizzled specific variants of Wnt that we could use as either antagonist or agonist to probe, to probe Wnt biology. And there are several problems that we've faced uh, in, in taking this on. One is this recurrent issue that Wnt's are not water soluble. So it's not like a typical growth factor like IL-2 where you can make large quantities and if it's very well behaved, um, this really is, a, is an intractable problem that we had to face. The second one is, you know, after, can we make it? The second one is, can we create agonists and antagonists that are frizzled specific? And maybe could we build a Wnt molecule that doesn't even look like Wnt? If Wnt is so intractable to make, maybe we could mimic Wnt activity in a completely different structural scaffold. And so that's what I'm going to tell you about here. We did an experiment in an effort to make a water-soluble Wnt by mutating the lipid binding site on Wnt, that finger that the lipid is projecting from, and then expressing it on yeast. And then error-prone, doing an error-prone reaction of this gene, 
and creating a large library on yeast and selecting them against the frizzled ligand binding domain. And the logic here was that maybe we could acquire compensatory mutations for a non-lipidated wint that would allow its expression and folding on the surface of wint. And we got what looked to be binders to frizzled 8 and frizzled 5 and a little bit to frizzled 4. And so we were encouraged maybe we had this molecule. But when we sequenced the gene, what we found was that everything from wind, of wind had been deleted out except the tip of this finger right here. That was, was, was remaining on the yeast and was binding to the CRD. And that fingertip recapitulates the specificity of the full-length wint that, that, I, that I showed you earlier. So that really told us that most of the specificity of wint is in this site right here. So we did a few experiments to look at this more carefully where we first, we cut out the fingertip of all these different wints and we just measured their binding on yeast to these different frizzles. And we found a rather unexpected result, which is that pretty much all of the wints, like frizzled 5 and frizzled 8, and have very low affinity or no affinity to the other frizzles. So we were expecting to see, to see a more populated um, matrix here. Then we did a, a little more hard-nosed experiment where instead of just looking at the fingertip, we grafted the fingertip from each one of these wints back into full-length Xenopus wind 8. So just grafting the fingertip and assess the binding of the full-length wind now. And you can see it recapitulated the same specificity as the fingertip. Um, and so this, this is puzzling because why do we have all these other frizzles if they're only binding to three or four, or two or three out of all of them? And this also is consistent, but it also contrasts a bit with a paper from Jeremy Nathans where he looked at the functional, he did an interactome of 20, of 16 wints against the 10 frizzles using a signaling reporter assay, kind of an interactome experiment. And he found again that frizzles 5 and 8 are definitely the most preferred ones, but there are these pockets of weak activity with these other, with these other wints and frizzles there. So if there is a receptor ligand matching code here, it's very blurred. And to really ask this question cleanly, we wanted to de-blur this type of, of matrix here and make it look something like this, where we would have wints that specifically engaged one or specific combinations of frizzled that we can then go into biological assays and ask questions. And uh, we've, we've, we're in the process of doing this now. And the way we've done this since you cannot really work with a full-length Wnt molecule because of all of its biochemical problems associated with this lipid. So we're displaying the fingertip on yeast and we're creating these cyclic peptide libraries. We're selecting them on specific frizzles. So here's a selection of a library against frizzled 8. And you can see as we select and enrich and enrich, we grow this population of enriched fingers that we then graft back into full-length wind and act, act about, ask about its specificity. And doing that, we have been able to create monospecific and bispecific versions of Xenopus wind 8. And so we're in the process of testing these molecules now with Randy Moon and several others in several uh, wind uh, functional assays to ask whether the diminished specificity or the altered specificity what are the consequences it has? And so we're, 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 we're in the process of doing this, but this approach appears to work in principle. The second approach that we're using is to create wints that don't look like wint. In other words, wint surrogates. And this is also something that we've done a lot of with cytokines as well. And um, our approach here was, so we engaged David Baker, who's a uh, protein designer um, uh, extraordinaire at University of Washington. Maybe David's even given one of these Walls lectures. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, but, and what we presented him with was the structure of Wnt with that lipid in this groove of the frizzled CRD here. And challenged him to come up with a protein 
that would fit into the groove, replace the lipid with, let's say, an alpha helix, but then read out the peaks of these crests on the side of this trough right here where residue-specific, uh, frizzled residues that are specific to the, each subtype exist. And so one might have a, a lipid mimic that is frizzled-specific. And this is the protein design that he, came, that he and Luke Dang in his lab came up with. It's a four helix bundle protein where one of these helices would span the length of the lipid groove here, and these other helices would in many ways, uh, if you're a, a, into MHC molecules, that would bracket the sides of the groove here much in the way a T cell receptor sees a peptide MHC. So this was the design. And, and we spent a fair amount of time with David and Luke engineering the protein, and we finally came up with these variants that we, one of them called B12, and what you can see here is that B12 binds to frizzled 5 and frizzled 8 ligand binding domains with single-digit nanomolar affinity, and it doesn't bind to any of the others. So one of the reasons why this is significant is because um, making frizzled-specific antibodies has, been, uh, has not been accomplished. And several uh, drug companies who want to target frizzled as an anti-cancer target to block Wnt activity have generated antibodies to frizzled, but they all cross-react to most frizzled subtypes. So we'd like to make frizzled subtype variants, and it appears that we've done that, at least in, the, in, in this design here. Um, it also has weak blocking activity. This is a colon carcinoma cell line uh, that's Wnt sensitive, and you can see that we can compete with two different designs for Wnt activation of beta-catenin uh, signaling in these experiments in a dose-dependent fashion. But it's weak. It's a weak inhibition. And so why, why, why is that? Um, so this, this, is, this slide is, 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 a, is kind of an interesting slide. What I'm showing you here is the design from David of what the protein should look like binding to the frizzled CRD. And what you're about to see is the design is going to disappear, and we solve the crystal structure of where it actually binds. So uh, that's the design. There's where it actually binds. So in one, when you look at that, you could say, all right, well, they didn't quite get it. They blew it. But, but they got close. And you can see that the reason why this is probably partially inhibitory is the helix only interrupts a small part of this lipid binding groove here. So it's weakly inhibitory. But the, the surprising thing about this structure is that these helices sit down on frizzled in the perfect spot to read out specificity. In other words, this tryptophan residue here that's sticking up between these two alpha helices is subtype specific. And in fact, when we look at other residues that these helices are contacting, you can see how many of them are subtype specific. So even though we may have missed in creating the perfect Wnt inhibitor, we may have hit upon a great solution for a scaffold that can read out frizzled specificity and that we might be able to make frizzled specific antagonists, which would be another way of probing Wnt activity. And recently we've, we've, we've made use of the scaffold for another reason that is really going to be a big direction for where we're going with this project. So the way canonical Wnt signaling works is that Wnt engages frizzled and then it recruits LRP in to form a signaling complex. And many cell surface receptors signal just by dimerization, either homo or heterodimerization. And it appears that uh, no one has really known whether Wnt signals through simply bringing LRP or whether some specific conformational changes are required through frizzle that would be required for signaling. So now we have a surrogate protein that binds to the frizzled CRD. It does not induce signaling in frizzled. But what if we fuse this through a linker to a natural protein, DKK, that binds to LRP, and we enforce proximity of LRP to frizzled? Will this signal? And so we very recently did this experiment, 
And the answer is it does. So here's a beta-catenin assay that Claudia Janda in my lab did. And here's Xenopus Win8 act in a dose-dependent activation of beta-catenin. And here's our B12 DKK fusion protein. And it does so in a frizzled specific way. It does not activate frizzled 2 containing cells. It activates frizzled 8 and frizzled 5 containing cells. So now we have a water-soluble surrogate agonist of Wnt that appears to be a functional phenocopy of Wnt. And we very recently got some data from Randy Moon where they have been looking at our surrogate agonist in this neurosphere growth assay, which is they abstract stem cells from part of a mouse brain. And these stem cells, um, their self-renewal and differentiation is in large part controlled by Wnt. And they've been using Wnt 3A um, to, to, to do this. And you can see how these neurospheres expand in size over time. So when you look at our surrogate, it's much better than either of the wild type Wnt's here. So we're very excited about this. And you know, as projects tend to do in science, they kind of meander along in different ways. And you just keep doing things. And eventually, you see something that you didn't expect. And now you're going off in that direction. And so now we have a water-soluble wind agonist that's easily produced in very large quantities that we think and we're exploring might functionally phenocopy wind in every way. And so this would be really be a boon to the field. And it's also engineerable. So, so that's really um, where we are at the moment with the uh, wind engineering. Um, and uh, hopefully with making a, a, a whole battery of these frizzled specific agonists and antagonists, we'd really be able to revisit these kinds of questions of the role of wind frizzle specificity in these processes um, with an entirely new approach. OK. So I'm going to segue here uh, in a rather jarring way that it may seem right now, but in the end, I think you're going to see there's some, some thematic synergy with what I just spoke about. Um, going into this, uh, talking about de-orphanizing receptors. And, um, and so the reason why I have this, I put this, uh, this watercolor from the uh, 36 views of Mount Fuji up here from Hukuse was because in thinking about whether I should make this transition, which didn't seem to make sense at the time, you know, I was thinking that, that really structural biology is essentially viewing a molecule or problems from different vantage points. And so uh, you know, uh, that's what we do. It's a descriptive field. And so um, you know, we've had one view of Mount Fuji here. And uh, this is a second view of Mount Fuji here with the overall problem of understanding receptor ligand interaction. So if that helps smooth the transition for you, um, feel free uh, to, to use that. All right. So I think we can all agree that cell surface receptors and their ligands are important. I, probably most everyone would agree. Um, and yet most of them are orphans. And the number, the, the, the number of orphans, the percent of orphans uh, our genome encodes uh, two or 3,000 cell, cell surface receptors, approximately equal number of secreted proteins that would pair with them. Um, the estimates are in the range of 50% of cell surface receptors are orphans, and 50% of secreted ligands do not have known receptors. And this is something that has profoundly bothered me over the years because, you know, as a structural biologist, one of the frustrations of our field is that we're always in the position of describing discoveries that others make. And so we come in usually late, like in the wind field. We came in late uh, after all the fun, a lot of the fun biology has been worked out. Um, and so what I really want to do is be ahead of that curve and discover new interactions and then fully characterize their functions as well as their structures. And so. This problem of cell surface receptor deorphanization seemed like something that, as a biochemist, that my lab might be able to have a new approach to do that that could be useful in this regard. And we applied it to adhesion receptors. So receptors come in many different types. Um, they, they bind to soluble mediators. Um, they can bind in trans and cis. But we focused on these receptors that mediate cell junctions. And um, many of them are Ig superfamily class receptors and leucine rich repeat receptors. And Ig superfamilies are the largest class of receptors, cell surface receptors we have in our genome and that, and that other organisms have in their genomes. 
and leucine-rich repeat proteins uh, are second. And most of them are, as well, about orphans. Now, deorphanizing receptors is extremely technically challenging because they, they have to, they're on membranes, they're post-translationally modified, they're glycosylated. So systems biology type of proteomics type of tap-tagging approaches are very messy. They don't work very well for cell surface receptors. They work well for cytosolic proteins, but not these kinds of proteins. And so what we do in my lab is we've spent a long time looking at the extracellular domains of receptors. So we thought, well, what if we, what if we express every extracellular domain of a given family of receptors and we array them in a pairwise way, looking for homo and heterotypic interactions, what would we find? Could we find biochemically bona fide hits and then work backwards to the function? And so that's the project that I'm going to tell you about today. We went into Drosophila because it has fewer genes, and we cataloged the Ig superfamily receptors, fibronectin type 3 receptors, and leucine rich repeat receptors. There are about 200, 202 of them. And we expressed all of their extracellular domains to do this pairwise interaction matrix which would comprise about 40,000 experiments looking at 20,000 unique pairwise interactions, 200 homophilic, 20,000 heterophilic. And the way we did this was a relatively simple assay where we expressed each extracellular domain in the bait form and the prey form. And the bait form was connected to an FC, and the prey form was alkaline phosphatase linked, but importantly, it was a pentamerized, a five-stranded coil-coil alkaline phosphatase linkage because many adhesion receptors have very low affinity. And so we use the pentamerization to raise the avidity to be able to capture these low affinity interactions. And the, what we did is we expressed in Drosophila cells the ECDs of all 202 of these in both bait and prey. We arrayed them in blocks, all by hand. And the experiment looks like this. You, you, ca you, you have your protein A ELISA plates, you capture your bait FC, you come along with your prey, and if it binds, it turns blue. And that's what the assay looks like. And you can statistically analyze the signal to noise all day long in that plate, but in the end of the day, the way we made the calls was we held the plate up to the light and said there's a blue spot. And it's 100% accurate. Okay. So that's what the matrix looked like uh, after, after the experiment was completed. This is uh, prey along this, this axis, beta along. We have positive controls, internal controls for known interactions to make sure we recover what's known. And this was our yield. Um, for homophilic interactions, uh, we recovered 20 hits, of which 16 were previously known and four were novel. For the heterophilic, we screened 20,000 possible pairs, found 86 interactions, of which 80 of them were novel. And none of these were identified from proteomic type of um, uh, uh, cell, cell uh, you know, massive IP type of uh, systems biology approaches. And I think one of the reasons that our results were so clean is that we're literally, it's a pairwise approach. We're using recombinant proteins one against one. And this is a summary of the nodes that we found here. And we found, uh, so the blue lines indicate previously unknown interactions here. And uh, this is the largest family we found. It's a family of Ig superfamily proteins uh, called the DIPs and the DPRs. Um, these were these uh, formerly uh, the gene accession numbers. And uh, we found a common leucine rich repeat family which seemed to interact with some, some of both sides of this equation. We also deorphanized many members of this other uh, receptor ligand uh, family here, beaten path and sidestep. And uh, we also recovered these known hits here. The, the red lines indicate interactions which were previously known. So that was, that was very satisfying to see. But the nice thing is that we found families. So these evolutionarily uh, these proteins are evolutionarily linked, and they engage other families that are also evolutionarily linked. Now, 
focusing on, on this dip DPR node right here, um, knockouts of the DPR had been known. These were called defective proboscis extension response. And this is, these uh, were known to be active in the nervous system in gustatory organs and required for salt aversion, but their ligands weren't known. So now we have their ligands, and clearly most of these uh, look to be active in the nervous system. We validated these hits biochemically by surface plasmon resonance, where we expressed recombinant extracellular domains of, of these pairs, and we measured binding affinities. And one very important validation criteria here was they give us mathematically fittable binding isotherms by surface plasmon resonance. Nonspecific interactions do not exhibit that kind of behavior. So that's a very robust test that these kind of hits are probably biologically relevant. And then, uh, so as one example, we're finding that inaffinity for DPR6 to a dip is about one micromolar, and the affinity of this common dip for, uh, for, for one of the uh, CGs down here is on the order of the same. So these are low affinity interactions consistent with cell surface adhesion molecules. We think this common dip might be some sort of negative regulator of the interactions of these pairs. Now, we've been working with Kaizen at Caltech to assess the biological relevance of these and the functions of these interactions. And uh, what Kai has been using is the actual alkaline phosphatase fusion proteins we used in our experiment to stain Drosophila live sections. And it's an antibody labeling methodology. And just to show you some of the data, this is this common dip that seems to bind to most members of that family. And you can see that it's expressed pretty much in almost all subsets of neurons here. Um, whereas others, uh, oh, we also did a, Kai also did an experiment where we looked at a particular pair that we found, the CG14521 binding to DPR11. And you can see that the, the staining is very nice here in a wild type animal, but in the CG14521 knockout uh, fly, we lose the staining. And we've gone on now uh, to make what are called mimic clones, in which the gene is not knocked out, it's replaced by, by GFP. And so that's a marker that, the still, that it's still there. So what you can see here is a heterozygote mimic, where the green cells represent the knockout. And you can see there's partial staining here of, of, the, um, of the DPR11 AP. But in the homozygous mimic, you still see the green cell there, but there's no expression and there's also no staining of DPR11. So we found the interaction biochemically, and now we know that it actually appears to uh, occur in live cell embryos. And uh, this is some recent data from Kai as well on some of these other interacting members. Um, and the point is that each one of these different genes and their partner are expressed in distinct subsets of neurons. Each one of these green uh, 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 nodes here is, is a neuron, but they're expressed in the same place. So it's reasonable to think that they could um, have, a, have an interaction in a, in, in a live animal. Now, of course, I'm a, I, I'm a structural biologist, and we're interested in this adhesion family here, understanding the structural basis of the interaction. So we recently solved the crystal structure of one of these new deorphanized pairs, and that's showing you right here that these are two IG domains. This is a two IG domain um, of, the, of the CG and one IG domain of the DPR6, and they form this, this almost orthogonal type of interaction here. And um, until we have more functional data about what these interactions are actually doing in the fly, uh, we can't really say much more about that. But it is notable uh, because we also had been looking at structures of another set of adhesion family members here, uh, the roughest, hibbest, sticks and stones family that are also called nephrons in humans. And the nephrons are a large family of adhesion, uh, cell adhesion molecules that um,
Well, my computer looks fine. There we go. Okay, it was a little loose here. Um, okay. Okay, so these, these form uh, the filtration barrier in the kidney slit diaphragm, these in humans, in mammals, the nephrons. Um, and they also have other functions uh, in synaptogenesis and C. elegans. They form, they form the vulval synapse, the, the same class of molecules. They're also involved in the, myogen in the myoblast fusion, and they also form other cell-cell uh, junctions. And um, these molecules are long Ig superfamily uh, containing um, uh, receptors, and we crystallized a complex between Sig1 and Sig2, and it has this uh, same orthogonal topology here. And we also crystallized these other members of this family, and they all share the same orthogonal topology. And when you compare that to the DPR, the new deorphanized DPR interaction, they're absolutely dead on. And so we're thinking that maybe these adhesion molecules have this shared architecture, the shared docking topology, between, because in some way it's conducive to the formation of a functioning synapse. And what, what has bolstered this idea a little bit more is that we've now looked by electron microscopy at the full-length ectodomains of these molecules, and you can see how they're quite rigid. And when they bind to each other, they form this L shape. So the crystal structure was just the N-terminal domains, but now we can see how they're forming this this, this rod is propagated along both axes here. And so that L-shaped would be represented um, in this synapse here, where we, we modeled it here. And so this really raises the question, does this structure matter to the synapse? Is the rigidity important for the synapse? And is the docking geometry important? So we, uh, we uh, collaborated with Kang Shen and uh, we use this uh, synapse formation assay in C. elegans vulva. And you can see in a normal synapse, a GFP labeled SIG2 localizes to this uh, synapse right here when wild type SIG1 is present. When you mutate it, uh, the SIG2 drifts away and you don't get a proper synapse formation there. And so what we did was we made mutations in this interface right here and ask about the the, the, the synapse formation, and what you can see is that the free energy of the mutations that we made in the synapse track perfectly with the ability to form the synapse. In other words, this phenylalanine 60 mutation in that interface almost completely blows away binding and we lose almost all synapse formation, whereas mutations that have less of an effect have less. So what this means is that the in vivo readout is a faithful representation of the free energy of the interaction in that interface here. And that's a very unusual position to be in. So we went on and we did two things. We, we, we inserted flexible linkers between the IG domains of SIG1 and SIG2. And you can see how, compared to the wild type, introducing flexibility impairs the ability to form synapses. And the second thing we did was that we replaced the interacting Ig domains with Ig domains from other immunoglobulin receptor proteins that, that bind in a different docking topology. And when we do that, we also impair synapse formation. So it appears within the synapse, this L-shaped topology and the rigidity of these molecules is important for the, for the, for, for the functional uh, formation of a, of, of a working synapse. And perhaps this is true um, across a larger body of adhesion receptors, including the dips that we just talked about previously. So the way this might look is that within the synapse, you have this L-shaped structure, and it forms a, this tightly packed array that uh, in three dimensions um, forms kind of a meshwork-like structure. And the particular shape and properties of this uh, could be important for close packing of these molecules. So I think uh, I'm going to stop uh, at this point um, and, uh, and thank uh, uh, the people who participated in these projects. Claudia Janda was uh, really carried the ball in the WINT project uh, for pretty much all of the structural work. 
and we've been re recently having great collaboration with David Baker and Randy Moon on getting back into the functional aspect of the project. Engen Ozkan is now an assistant professor at University's, University of Chicago, really did all of the interactome and SIG structural and biochemical work, um, and we collaborated with Kong Shen um, uh, on, the, um, on some of the recent functional uh, work in C. elegans, and Sue Selnicker was a huge uh, collaborator for the interactome project at the uh, Berkeley Drosophila fly genome base. And just before closing up uh, here permanently, I just wanted to tell you that really this idea of pairing receptors with their ligands in this kind of uh, singular pairwise way I think is a very powerful approach, and I think it's scalable um, to do the human genome. And so really um, this is something that uh, we're, we're, we're developing uh, the idea to, to, to do this, and I think it could have a tremendous information yield, um, and, uh, and so that's going to be a big future direction of the lab. So I think I'll just stop here and take questions. Terrific. If you have questions, please, there are microphones in the aisles so that people can hear the question who are watching by video. And uh, we have time for several of those, so please. While people are getting to the mic, in terms of the assay that you showed us, which looked very nice in terms of looking for homo and heterodimers, but looked like it could also apply to ligand receptor interactions, yes. have you tried it out that way, and does it in fact perform well? Absolutely. Yeah, it's very robust, um, and, and it's, it, it works. The, the avidity enhancement we get by using the pentamer it's so sensitive that we detect interactions of molecules that we don't even see expression of by Western blot. So it's, it's that sensitive. Yes. Very good talk. Can you give us an idea of the statistics for or the crystallography data, such as B factors and resolution? for all the structures that you calculated for went and frizzle? Sorry? Uh, so uh, some of the specific crystallographic data, such as the resolution that you obtained, B factors. Well, the WIMP structure was uh, about 3.2 angstroms. The SIG structures were on the same order. Uh, the other statistics, like B factors and things, are, are perfectly normal, and you can find them in the papers. Thanks. And also. Uh, what happens if you remove the fatty acid tail from, from wind? Or how short can you go with that fatty acid tail until you lose interaction completely? So this is the problem with wind is that the wind doesn't secrete without that fatty acid on it. There's an enzyme uh, called porcupine that's an evolutionarily very conserved enzyme that's responsible for adding that lipid to wind. And, um, if that lipid addition site is not there, Wnt does not get out of the ER. Yeah, yeah so why IG domain only? Seems to be the, the, uh, the dwarfing uh, uh, stuff. Seems to me that the intrinsic design can be applied to, for example, screen for TCR ligand as well. Yes. So why just IG domain? And, and, and many Many uh, protein uh, receptor ligands are not bound within IG domain, you know very well. So, for example, you know, IG domain receptor CD4 would interact with uh, TCR uh, MSC, which is, uh, you know, the, the part is non IG. Yeah. So, so that's yeah. So, first of all, IG domains are the most, uh, are the largest family of, of, of structural class of cell surface receptors. So we focused on them. Um, this was a, a, a proof of concept experiment to really ask if we could deorphanize receptors on a large scale. And so IG superfamily receptors, um, they're not heterodimers. I mean, we would just wanted single, single polypeptide chains. So really, we chose it out of simplicity. And here's the other thing. We chose it because from fly because the total number is manageable because when you do a screen like this, you can't do part of it. You have to do the whole thing, or you don't, or shouldn't even try because you're going to miss. And so there were 200 or so IG superfamily plus leucine rich repeat, and we calculated given the people working on the project, we had the bandwidth 
to handle a 20,000 matrix array. So like the human genome has about um, 600 Ig superfamily containing receptors. Um, so that would be about a 400,000 array, um, but uh, you know this is easily scalable to do that. Yeah. Over here. Uh, in terms of the actual mechanism of frizzled signaling, do you think Wnt binding actually causes a conformational change, or just brings it together with other surface molecules to lead to signal well, transduction? Well, that, that's a very good question because. You know, there's a long litany of literature about the complexities of the frizzled signaling mechanism in response to Wnt. And with that one experiment we showed, where if you just bring LRP together with frizzled in a complete, in a way that, that is completely unlike Wnt, you get a signal. So I think it's probably simpler than it has been made out to be. Have you tried tethering that artificial molecule to another? interaction domain to bring it together with one of the other co-receptors? Uh, we haven't tried that yet, no. But we're trying a lot of things now along this, along this angle. Thanks. Yep. Well, I think uh, there may be other questions people would like to pose to the speaker. We can adjourn now to the NIH library. Please come and join for coffee and cookies. But let's thank Dr. Garcia again. Thank you. Thanks very much. That's a wonderful evolutionary story.